Liam is a PhD researcher and assistant lecturer in the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Technical University Dublin. His research is focused on the in situ measurement of the dynamic energy and carbon performance of lime hempcrete building materials. He is also currently collaborating with Steve Allen to research alternative recipes for hempcrete binders. So without further ado, our next presenter, Liam Donahue. Okay. Hi everybody. Have you had a nice lunch? <laughs> Woo! So my name is Liam. Thank you very much, Maddie, for the kind introduction. Um, I want to also thank the, uh, I suppose I should st stand out here so you can see me. Um, so I want to also thank the, uh, the previous speakers, uh, Alex and uh, the panel, and also uh, the, the ladies from uh, New York. I thought they were really interesting speakers, and give them a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, so, my, f my talk is entitled uh, Hemp Building a Brave New World. And I was just talking with uh, Steve Allen there, and we were discussing about how, uh, you know, the, the ladies mentioned about the indigenous form of hemp that was, that was uh, found in America. And he was talking about uh, hemp being brought over by the Pilgrim Fathers. And just like Alex also spoke about earlier, um, shipping and traveling by ship and the Pilgrim Fathers is a theme uh, of my talk as well. And I, I was a little bit annoyed with Alex that he went on. He stole a few of my ideas before I had the chance to um, share them, but not to worry. Maybe it's just that we all think alike as well. Um, so obviously, uh, a few other things I'd like to draw your attention to. I've, you know, I don't have any pictures of hemp in my presentation. I have pictures of sunflowers because, you know, obviously they're beautiful to look at. But also, you know, I, I suppose I'm, I'm a kind of a person that's very practical minded. And I kind of think, you know, what's the big deal with hemp and all this legislation and all the problems around it? It's a bit of a distraction. I mean, it's just another plant, right? I mean, so, you know, we, we really need to get beyond that. It's not really an area that I'm in, but uh, hopefully, um, you know, with the, with the farm bill and so on that's been passed, it'll actually, you know, America will kind of lead the way in this. It's still quite restricted in Europe. And it's kind of dumb because, you know, I can kind of understand that if you're making um, hemp for purposes other than building that you know there may be some issues but uh, I, I don't really see if you're growing it to feed your cattle or to uh, make blocks you know why you need a license from the government but anyway um, that's my uh, contribution to the political side of it um, so uh, I also decided to speak about a brave new world because uh, I'm going to play a little little bit of have a little bit of fun with you uh, in my talk um, so again, this is something that, that Alex and Steve kind of started was kind of using quotes and uh, references to books that they've read and so on. And um, so I decided I'd really take this and run with it. So I've got uh, a number of references to um, different books and songs and things in my presentation. And uh, anybody who comes up at the end and spots them all, I'll buy them a drink over in Hemingway's bar uh, afterwards, all right? So that's a promise. Um, I had a, an old-fashioned there last night. It really hit the spot, okay? Um, so it is a new world. Uh, you know, I guess we're a little bit like the Pilgrim Fathers uh, coming over here to talk, uh, hopefully to help uh, the U.S. Hemp Building Association get off the ground and and get stuck into to some serious hemp building over here. Um, it's, you know, that's, that's what we want, yeah. Um, you know, it's obviously been a difficulty, as, as the panel spoke about earlier, obviously getting materials here up until now, so I'm sure that'll change. And I'm sure, as with many other things, you know, in five or 10 years, it will be the US who are, we're, we're following. You know, uh, there's no question about that. All right, um, but it is a brave new world, right? Um, it's brave and it's foolhardy, and as 
Alex showed with some of the ex examples, kind of reckless, uh, you know, to, to start in this domain because you're up against such very established practices and ways of doing things, right? And uh, myself, my background, I am a PhD researcher now. I'm also a lecturer, but I also founded a, a company in the UK called Black Mountain Insulation Limited. They, they had an office here in the US for a little while. And we, uh, very similar to the story that Alex was telling you about with Hemcor, uh, we raised quite a lot of money uh, to set up a, a, a factory in North Wales, which originally processed sheep's wool. Uh, we kind of didn't think much of hemp, uh, to be honest. Uh, we thought sheep's wool was better than hemp, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, as an insulation material. We sold it for attics and um, uh, walls and, and so on in, in, in bats and rolls. And then we did start making hemp. And in fact, it was hemp that kind of kept the company going for a good couple of years uh, because the sheep's wool was quite expensive uh, and hemp was coming in at a slightly more reasonable uh, rate for materials. Uh, so between one thing and another, I, I had to exit that company. Um, I sort of had learned a lot about specification of materials. Uh, you know, I wasn't an architect, I was actually a computer programmer originally. Um, I learned a lot about spe specification of materials and I decided I'd sort of go into the business in another area, which was energy labeling certification of buildings. Um, so you have kind of schemes like that here as well, but within Europe, they are the law now, right? And they sort of govern almost the building of every new building has to have a certificate. And for an architect to use your material, uh, your material has to be tested. It has to be tested in um, an accredited laboratory, and it has to have a number. And so when I put all those kind of things together, uh, you know, I decided uh, I got very interested in hemp at this point. I don't particularly know why. I mean, I, I can see certain inflection points where my interest really began. One of them was doing a, a, a building course with Steve um, at, at one point. Um, you know, as you probably know, he's sort of pioneered, uh, you know, the, the extraordinary thing about that course was there were people there from all over the world and it was in a very remote place, probably more remote than where we are now, right? I know this feels like the backwoods to some of you, right? But uh, it was just a little bit off, more off the beaten track. Um, and, you know, you know, it just showed me how powerful an idea is. An idea is powerful when, when it attracts people from all over the world and it sort of, you know, transcends uh, the uh, kind of initial person or whoever who taught it up. If it's a really good idea, it sort of spreads its wings and it flies around the world and people want to know more about it. And that's what hemp building is. Hemp building is a very good idea, right? And, you know, if we didn't all realize that uh, before coming here, hopefully we'll realize it after today. All right, um, so I'm just going to uh, kind of go on with my little slideshow here. Um, you know, one of the things that I think, and some people did sort of speak about this earlier on, was that, you know, we need a kind of a slogan. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, somebody else was kind of uh, joking at the marketing person there, but, you know, Henry Ford had a slogan. You know, all these people who sort of, changed uh, how we do things in a fundamental way, um, they, they do manage to sort of capture something with a logo or with an idea or with a, an aphorism. And, you know, I, I, I can't believe I'm actually saying that now. I, a few years ago, I'd never have said anything like that, but I, but I have uh, a couple of kids now, um, you know, with this beautiful woman here who's also from the US, by the way. Uh, but uh, what, uh, I'm sort of old enough to remember is that these slogans here on the left-hand side have been used to sell us good ideas, you know, like eating an apple or uh, that we should drink milk, um, you know, how much vegetable we should eat. Um, and they've become sort of ingrained in uh, our way of thinking and way of doing things. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we were standing here in in five or 10 years and, you know, instead of, you know, 
moaning given out about overzealous regulators. We had a number of uh, politicians here trying to get involved and figure out how to run a public health campaign based on hemp. I mean, that's uh, the objective, right? You know, so, so this is the start of it. This is the start of it. Um, so, um, anybody spot my, my, uh, my, my pop culture reference? No? Come on. Any country, country fans here? No? Okay, it's Randy Travis. And uh, the reason I chose that, um, that's from his Forever and Ever Amen song. I, I chose that because it's very popular in weddings. It's one of the most popular wedding songs ever. So, yeah, that's, that's a bit far out in fairness. Okay. And this one's even harder, all right? But, um, you know, definitely whoever gets this will get like two old fashions or something. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, this one's from an Irish playwright and it was written in the 1910s, 1920s, about the, s the start of what we call the modern era, right? Probably maybe even World War I or whatever. And we do live in that sort of a time at the moment, don't we? You know, we do feel like that. Uh, that the, there's a lot of kind of crazy stuff going on and we're not really sure how or where it's going to go, right? And, uh, you know, our kind of current politics reflects that, you know, some of the stuff that's happening all over the world, but of course, what's happening with, with climate change and, you know, what can often seem like our inadequate response to it is troubling, right? And it troubles a lot of people and probably leads to the sort of, uh, indirectly at least, to the kind of political uncertainty we have, right? But, you know, the basics remain the same, right, for everybody in the world. The basics are that, you know, we need shelter, we need a place to live, right? And what's really happening and changing in the world, I mean, Alex spoke about how young people today in our societies are not willing to accept a kind of a, an old-fashioned way of doing business, right? You know, they, 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 they want to see what the credentials of the business are and are they really there? Um, is there authenticity and so on? But that's in our world. We've evolved to a, a, a state of luxury where we can actually be concerned about those kind of issues. Whereas in the developing world and, you know, the, the middle tier, you know, they're where we were 40 or 50 years ago. And sometimes even, uh, you know, they want to have what we have, right? They want to have our standards of health care, our standards of education, our standards of uh, gender equality and so on, right? And they particularly want to have our standards of building, right? Which, you know, people might say that our standards are not so great, but they're a lot better than what's available in many parts of the world, right? And that demand is what's feeding uh, some of the issues that we face, you know, the, and the population is growing. It's a, so I see it as a problem of success, not a problem of failure, but of course it's a very challenging one. Now, uh, so again, a little reference for you. Uh, as builders and as hemp advocates, are we the lunatics on the grass or will I see you on the dark side of the moon? So I hopefully you'll get that one. Okay. All right. Um, so, as I said, I'm a, I'm a kind of a, a glass half full guy. You know, I see an opportunity. Uh, I see the, the, the what's happening with the climate as a chance for us to really change things for the better. Um, you know, whether we do that or not and the degree to which we're successful, you know, is, is, is yet to be seen, obviously. Uh, but I, I do sense, and in, in my work I mentioned that I, I do a lot of work um, doing energy ratings for people where I go to their home, I talk to them, you know, I try and persuade them maybe to do weatherproofing, uh, to apply for government grants, uh, to consider maybe changing from using their oil furnace or, or whatever to something more renewable. And what I've noticed is a massive change in people's attitudes to that. You don't have to convince them anymore, you know. And, you know, it's happened in the blink of an eye. I, I mean, literally. Uh, and it could be because of Greta Thunberg, it could be any myriad number of reasons, uh, but it's definitely happening. So it is an opportunity and we must remember that and we must seize it, okay? Um, so 
uh, that's really continuing my theme there, you know, the, the, the classic sort of um, definition of sustainable development. And you can see that it, uh, I've highlighted what I think are the, the two key words which are without compromising. And it's without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Because our progress that we've made to date, you know, we haven't, we've done the first part of it, but we haven't really done the second part. Isn't that right? I mean, we, we, we're not going to argue about that. Okay, now, just a little diversion again. I was looking at, uh, uh, just was doing my research, and I wanted to get my quotes right. And I suppose what I'm trying to say here is that I'm, I'm a glass half full sort of guy. And the end of this sentence uh, was made kind of famous by Tom Waits, but it actually came from Dorothy Parker, apparently. And the end of it, if, in case you're not familiar, is I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy, okay? Um, so uh, I, was, I, was, I was looking, I wanted to get it right as to, you know, who said it and all this. So I was looking at this, and, and there was a, a video of Tom Waits saying this on YouTube on Letterman or something like that. And somebody wrote underneath it that, you know, this is the kind of logic that uneducated fi people find amusing. Believe me, Tom doesn't adhere to this principle and hasn't in decades. Uh, this is only something you do when you're young. If you're still doing it when you're old, you got some issues you need to look at and grow up and get yourself to AA. All right. So, okay. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, Sergey also spoke about uh, building from the past, right? You know, are we really reinventing the wheel here? People often used some of the techniques that we now call sort of new techniques or innovative techniques in architecture. People were aware of these 150 years ago. And uh, this really came home to me uh, uh, when I went and I visited my my grandfather's home, all right, and you can see it's pretty modest uh, these days. It's probably used for housing animal feedstock or something, but it was built 150 years ago, very limited resources, probably built by a whole community, all right, by neighbors and friends and cousins and so on, and it's still as dry as a bone, right? It's had a few kind of mishaps like trees growing and so on in the side there, and a roof that um, I believe, and it didn't happen in my time, but some other family members were still living in that house up to about 40 years ago, and there was a big wind one night, and it, the, a tree came through the roof. All right, and they all came down to our house, uh, and there was great crack, apparently. Um, so, you know, you know the, the cliche about the Irish is they'll turn anything like that into an excuse to have a party. Yeah, my roof fell down, okay. Um, so, anyway, um, the point I'm making is that, you know, there's, there is a lot of evidence here, this is an earth building, a lot of evidence here that the people who knew what they were doing, unsophisticated people, you know, farmers, uneducated really, that they knew how to build a building that would last for 150 years and keep everything inside dry. Um, so it's not that difficult, right, uh, but it's something maybe we have to relearn, all right? Um, so, again, a little bit of uh, literary um, embellishment for you. All right. So, why hemp building? All right. So, you know, Alex spoke about this so eloquently earlier. Um, and, you know, those of us who've been fortunate enough to be involved for a couple of years now have sort of uh, seen a lot of things in it that we like. All right. And, uh, you know, in a way, uh, it's easy for us to kind of forget that, right? Uh, that that we've sort of had this kind of eureka moment. Um, but it's no good if we're just talking to like-minded people all the time. You know, we, each of us today, you know, should go away from here, hopefully, with a sense that we could introduce other people to this sort of uh, uh, holistic world as well. All right? So what are the things? Well, as I mentioned, there's a bit of a sense of community to it, right? Really, you know, one thing that's always struck me when I go to these gatherings is how accessible people are, how down to earth, you know, friendly, very willing to share information, people from all over the world, you know, and, and it's, that's a rare enough thing in, in today's world. Um, also, it has a societal value, right? Because maybe, you know, we've, uh, as we have with food and with all kinds of production, we have kind of um, lost sight of the producer and 
you know, where it's coming from. It's like uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday, um, and they said it was um, Oren there, I think, and he said that his kids think that, you know, uh, food comes from Walmart, and so do mine, right? You know, so we, we've kind of lost sight of a little bit of that, and, and hemp sort of brings that back, because in theory, we could see now that our houses could be built from something from by the guy that was had that little hemp farm across the road and we processed it and then we got the shivs it didn't travel very far and then we built it all right um and we also have an holistic uh, aspect to it because like the ladies from uh, parsons were saying uh, hemp building has an incredible sort of uh, hemp building has an incredible attribute in terms of indoor air quality why? Because we're not putting in all that other rubbish. We don't need to. Um, it's, it's there already, uh, the inherent breathability and all that kind of stuff that we're adding to conventional building materials in order to try and make them fi fireproof and, and damp-proof and so on. We don't need to do that with hemp, all right? Uh, we also uh, have a business aspect to it. We, we can make a business out of it and it's hard uh, at the moment but uh, I'm sure many of you here today are here for that reason because you can sense that there's some potential in it but of course the main thing is that it works right I mean and uh, that's what I really encourage you to do if you haven't and uh, hopefully some of you will come tomorrow if you haven't been to a hemp building so far go and see one immediately right because nothing will convince you more than that if you haven't been on a course go and do a course anybody can build with it really anybody and anybody can see that it works almost immediately all right uh, so just to uh, sort of go on then uh, here um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about what I'm doing and why I hope that our work will help to uh, construct this brave new world and, and assist the, the, the people who are involved in it. Um, so I started my PhD about two or three years ago. You know, I, I'm working uh, in a little business uh, as well, and I'm also started teaching now quite uh, professionally. So <coughs> I'm not quite making as much progress with it as I would like, but I, I've decided, I've set myself a deadline of next year to conclude it. And here are the things I'm looking at. Um, so uh, Ridwin there is a, a researcher from the Welsh School of Architecture. And, uh, you know, I think he was involved with the, the cat building, which uh, some of you were, were speaking about earlier. Um, so he has a, a lovely little article about, you know, building with hemp and lime, a kind of a summary article where he, he uh, draws on uh, kind of some of the published papers and projects and, and things that have happened to date uh, from an architectural perspective. And what he sort of said is that in terms of embodied energy, so embodied energy is a term that refers to the amount of energy that went into the construction of the materials, production of the materials in a building. So he said that hemp lime can actually range uh, from being positive to negative in terms of carbon potential, depending on how the lime is processed, right? So, uh, and obviously depending how far the hemp shiv has to travel and all of those other factors, all right? So what I began thinking about was, you know, are there other binders that could be used? Are there other recipes? You know, it's fascinating to see, you know, what they were doing in India there. Um, you know, I've been talking a little bit with other PhD students from the School of Culinary Arts, and I learned a lot from them about baking, and I realized that it was completely transferable to the way we were mixing our hempcrete binders. And what we're specifically looking at is, you know, can we replace some of the lime? Can we replace some of the cement? The early sort of proprietary binders, that was something Alex sort of touched on as well. They, not only did that company not want to, Alex, to uh, sell their materials or to use them without having uh, done a training course, but they also wanted him to use their binder, which was proprietary and, how would you say, protected, right? And, you know, I'm looking at totally doing the opposite of that, right? You know, I want people to be able to make hempcrete from whatever binder and materials they have 
within 100 miles of them, if that's possible, right? Because that's how we then improve the embodied energy of the material. Now, obviously, some materials have characteristics that when you mix them, uh, they're less desirable than others. So, for example, if, if strength is a consideration for, the, for the, the mix, you know, you will have to have a certain amount of materials that, that look or behave a little bit more like cement, right? If drying is um, uh, a consideration, you know, you have to uh, reflect that in the binder. If insulation properties are what you're looking for and you can vary those, Again, uh, you would vary the mix accordingly. So what I'm hoping is that, you know, what we're doing is we're starting the beginning of a sort of a, a database, a knowledge base of facts and figures, right? As dull and as boring as that. That's why I wanted to make some jokes and things earlier, right? Um, that we're, we're going to have a database that people could look up or an app or something. So, you know, I have this much hydrated lime. I have this much calcined clay locally. You know, how do I blend that together to make a hempcrete block and how will it behave? Right, And then, of course, what we need is we need a series of very fairly simple tests that people can use to validate that material. So instead of going in to the local building control officer or your local architect and trying to convince them that, you know, I want to build a hempcrete house, can I get insurance for it, you know, and being told, no, you can't do that, you're going, here's how it's got, this is how I'm going to make the blocks Here's how it's going to perform. All right, sign here, please. Okay, you know we we have to take back the control from these kind of people who don't know anything about what they're talking about, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. Now uh, the other thing then is that um, I suppose what I was interested in, and this is really kind of putting my research hat and my business hat on, is how easy is it really? You know, do you like like lime is is uh, a tricky enough material, and as Alex showed in his presentation, it can go wrong, right? Um, so again, I'm I'm trying to sort of make that kind of information accessible to people and describe it in sort of layman's terms of you know when the mix is right. This is what it looks like, you know, and we probably, you know, we've kind of done it in writing and with pictures. We probably need to do a few videos or something just to, to, to sort of clarify that, right? So uh, usability equals US ability, all right? And then, of course, the main thing is our thermal and structural performance, right? Because we do have to meet building codes, but we also have to meet structural codes. And, you know, that's the kind of question that architects will ask, and, and it's a fair question. Uh, is how will this stand up? Uh, you know, they're used to dealing with concrete and it's got fairly known properties. Uh, so we've got to have some data there for that as well. All right. So, um, so again, uh, these researchers here uh, drew up a graph and they showed uh, what they call the dry thermal conductivity against total porosity. All right, and what they said was that and this was for concrete that it was found that the thermal properties are dependent on the materials added, proportions in the mixture, the amount of water used, and the degree of uh, porosity and the final density. And they speculated that uh, the same kind of principles could be applied to hempcrete. All right, because it contains about 60% lime. So, so again, what we're doing is we have sort of looked at a, a whole range of different binders, different materials, brick dust, uh, calcined clay, naturally occurring uh, cement, and so on. And what we're now going to try and do is consolidate all of that information into uh, a set of recipes and a set of material parameters. All right, now. This is going to take a long time, all right? Uh, I mean, I don't know why uh, I didn't realize this at the start. Could be back to my class half full kind of thing. Um, so we've done it with 30 binders, um, the, the mixed densities. Um, we've got a, a paper that will be coming out fairly soon, just when I tidied up a little bit. We observed the drying time because we wanted to see, you know, if, if these materials are just dried sort of naturally, how long that takes. 
right? Because the building industry, again, is, in, is used to just-in-time provision of materials, right? You, the guys were talking about that here earlier. What happens if they need more materials and they've got to ship them from halfway around the country? That's a problem, right? So uh, our sort of vision was that by giving all the material information, people could make their own materials and make them on site and precast them and then use them in the, um, in the, in the building season. Right, and this is just born out of kind of uh, some of the early research with hemp found that it was difficult to, um, in in the sort of winter season in the British Isles to, to 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 build with lime. Right, you know, it's just takes longer to dry and to set and so on. So so our our uh, kind of solution to that was let's change that problem. Let's just make make the bricks before uh, we build the house. You know, if if we can't do it in the summertime. Um, and then we tested the material strength, and as I said, we kind of characterized the workability. Uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, concrete industry uses uh, something called slump tests, to, uh, or Abrams cone tests, or something like that, to, to uh, characterize the workability of their materials. And we found they didn't really work for hemp. They're not, as, they're not the same, you know, it's not the same material. So, so we just came up with some very kind of simple metrics of, of our own, all right? Um, now, the next part of the work then is looking at what we're calling the dynamic energy performance of the material. So we'll probably select about six of those binders that we think have the most promise. And what we're going to do is we're going to engineer a special type of hotbox, all right? So um, what's happened uh, with conventional insulation materials? Well, maybe I'll just talk about this report first of all and then I'll come back to the problem, all right? So um, the BRE published a research study almost 20 years ago now where two houses were built with hempcrete and a third house was built or, you know, any number of houses with conventional masonry construction, all right? Now, what they found was that based on whatever design metrics they were using at the time, that in theory, these... Uh, control homes, a U value is just a measure of how much heat escapes from a house, like an R value here in the US. So what they found was that these control homes with conventional materials, they should have been more energy efficient than the hemp homes, according to the way the numbers were being calculated, right? So in actual fact, um, the actual temperature maintained in the hemp homes tended to be two degrees higher than the standard homes in winter, despite having the same heating fuel consumption for the period. So what that showed is there's something wrong with the way the numbers have been calculated for hemp. All right, either that or the houses were not built as designed. The, the, that's another possibility. But let's go with the first one, first of all. Um, so what they did then was they came along with thermographic cameras and they showed that the external temperature of the hemp home walls was five degrees lower than for the standard construction homes, despite the internal temperature being main, maintained at 20 degrees C in both. So what's actually happening is that the heat is migrating through the hemp material in a different way than it does through conventional materials. And the tests are written by the conventional materials industry and their representatives sit on the standards bodies, right? So in order to properly characterize performance of hemp homes and any natural building, right, whether it's straw or whatever, those standards have to be dumped and we have to have our own standards, all right? And we have to have our own test and that's what we're trying to develop. So we're, what we're trying to do is to simply discover, you know, can we uh, trap the trajectory of heat as it goes through a hemp home? Now, how, we're, how our test is different, than, and it's quite a difficult test to pull off, right? But how it's different from the other tests that have been previously done is those tests operate on what's called a steady state. All right, so they maintain the temperature at both ends of the material at a fixed amount and they measure the amount of time it takes to stabilize, okay? And what we're doing is we're actually, with controls, we're setting up a temper differ temperature differential to model the difference between the inside and outside temperature as if the, wa the wall was performing 
in the real world, not in the laboratory. Okay, so it's taken a bit of time. It's quite difficult. We've had one or two setbacks, all right. Um, for example, this year we started doing some of this work in June and we were trying to set the outside temperature with uh, our controls to say 20, uh, let's say we're trying to set it to 15 degrees. The room we were in was 20 degrees. It's unheard of for Ireland uh, to have those kind of indoor temperatures without heating. Um, and uh, that was kind of impacting on our ability to do the test at that time, right? So we've come up with a way around that where we kind of construct our hot box inside a fridge, all right? So we'll we'll... Next time you see me, I'll have results on that, okay? Um, so the road to hell is paved with good intentions, uh, another Randy Travis number. Um, and, you know, I need to talk about this because, you know, I, I, it's not to put a, a sour note on it, but, you know, even when we have the best will in the world, uh, things can go horribly wrong. And that's exactly what happened here in the Grenfell Tower disaster. There was... Uh, a misleaded, misguided effort to clad this building in energy efficient petrochemical materials, and that was the result. All right. So we've only got one shot at this, right? Uh, you know, well, we've got, we'll have more ups and downs and uh, stumbles and so on, but we've got to, because we're up against that level of inertia in the construction industry, we've got to try and have our numbers and our figures and our performance to stack up from day one, okay? Because if we don't, we can be sure that those people who, whose thinking results in that kind of scenario will think of a way to try and disparage us, all right? I mean, absolutely certain. I've, uh, sort of met enough of, of those kind of people to know that. Okay, so there's just more pictures of my hot box. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of, 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 as I said, concluding some of those thermal performance tests and further selection um, of the criteria for the materials. So I'm gonna finish with uh, something that I thought would sort of summarize my uh, talk. I'm probably horribly ahead of time now. Um, I got a little bit of a shock there when I saw that we had, uh, had an hour, um, but I'm gonna do a little bit of a karaoke session for you now, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, uh, I, I think it was Oren there yesterday, he was, he was, you know, made some remark about the Irish being drinkers or whatever. That stereotype is almost finished, Oren, I'm sorry. Uh, you're out of touch with that one. But we still like a song and a, a bit of crack, all right? Um, so maybe you'll all join with me. Uh, I'm going to encapsulate uh, some of my thoughts here today. Oh, we come on a ship they call the Mayflower. We come on a ship that sailed the moon. We come in the age's most uncertain hour and sing an American tune. I started too high. <laughs> oh, but it's all right. It's all right. You can't be forever blessed. Still, tomorrow's going to be another working day. And I'm trying to get some rest. Yes, I'm just trying to get some rest because I traveled a long way to be here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem.